Hi, everyone. I'm Randy Gregg, Executive Director of the Portland Parks Foundation. Welcome to our Green Dreams Happy Hour with um, City Council candidates, uh, Commissioner Chloe Udaly and Mingus Maps. Really appreciate you taking uh, time out of this beautiful evening to be with us. Um, and uh, thanks for your questions with uh, the registration. Um, I want to clarify uh, a couple of things. Uh, this, this forum is about parks. Uh, there have been and will be many forums to talk about housing, police, protests, and to the person who wrote one particularly detailed set of questions, Airbnb. Um, we have 60 minutes and I've tried to synthesize as many of your parks questions into what we can possibly cover in an hour. A um, couple of rules of the road. Uh, we've had, we've done, this is the third uh, panel that we've done, forum that we've done, and, and we've learned some stuff. Uh, so we'd like to ask you to not hog the chat room. Um, please share your thoughts and questions, but for your color commentary, I might suggest your personal social media channel. And don't be abusive. Um, our candidates are putting their time, potentially their careers aside to try and make our city better. You might disagree with them. Uh, but we want this forum to be respectful and polite. We'll offer one warning and then to anyone who persists, just like spam, we'll simply delete you. So we're going to begin with a poll. If you had to vote for one of these candidates right now, which one would it be? Okay. Okay, looks like Chloe's got some work to do tonight. Um, thanks for that. Let me get it out of my view. So um, let's see my questions. Okay, uh, so we're gonna start with uh, kind of a softball question, but sort of a fun one, get a little sense of, uh, uh, of who, who these folks are. Um, so if you could be a feature in a park, a fountain, a swing, a tree, a rhod rhododendron plant, uh, uh, what would you want to be? And uh, this, in effect, is your, your opening statement, and you'll have 90 seconds. Um, Commissioner, would you like to go first? Sure, uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having us here tonight. Uh, if I was a feature in a park, I would be a tree, and I'm going to say an oak tree just because I love, I love them. They, uh, I enjoyed them as a kid, and I think acorns are really neat. Uh, one of my favorite notable historic Portland residents is C.E.S. Wood. And one of my favorite quotes from him is that good citizens are the riches of the city. And I would consider trees to be the riches of our parks as well as the citizens of our parks in a sense. They have multiple values and provide multiple benefits uh, that far outweigh their actual dollar value. They're not just beautiful to look at, they provide, what does the bunny waving mean again? 15 seconds. Oh, okay. They provide shade, habitat, clean the air, produce oxygen, and they live in inter interdependent communities with many other species, including their own. They are one of our greatest assets and public treasures. Thank you. Thanks. Mingus? Um, and I too would be a tree. Um, since you daily took the oak, uh, maybe I'll go with a pine. Uh, and I relate to trees because um, I'm a lot like a tree. I'm tall, I'm sturdy, I'm still. Um, for me also trees, um, I think capture both Portland's history and our future. You know, I've been around Portland long enough that I can remember when we were a timber town. Um, and today, of course, we're a very different city. Uh, um, but at the same time, I think trees kind of point to the environmental challenges that we face um, as we go forward. Um, also, I think trees tell you something about a city. You know, you can take a look at an aerial map of any major city in America and tell where the wealthy people live and where the poor people live by seeing where the trees are. Uh, uh, the trees tend to correlate with uh, wealth. Uh, um, and so I also think of trees as being fundamentally an equity issue. If we build more trees, uh, we can serve our low-income communities better and provide uh, people with clean air. Thanks. So um, at this point in time, only one of you has endorsed the uh, levy going to the ballot on November 30th. Um, and so I'd like to hear um, whether you have, and if, if so, why, and if not, why not? Um, Mingus, we'll start with you. 
Sure. Well, I hope I was, I'm the one who has endorsed it. I do support this. I've been on board for months now. I've talked to several members of uh, city council about this. I support it because it's important to protect um, our natural environment. I really want to make sure that we restore um, our recreational uh, programs. Um, also at a time like this, when so many of us are sheltering at home, I think it's more important than ever and more salient than ever to have um, access to park services. And also I'm deeply concerned about um, preserving Serving uh, programming for uh, low income kids, things like camps and learning how to swim and lunch programs. I think all of those are uh, um, important services that will be able to continue if you vote for the levy. So uh, I'm going to do that and I hope you'll join me in that too. So uh, just to uh, clarify, that's news um, because we reached out to you uh, in the campaign and, and uh, um, I don't remember the exact wording of the, of the message we got back, but it was. Uh, um, something along the lines that you wanted to uh, huddle with your constituents and think about it. So, um, and you haven't formally endorsed. Yeah. I know I, my staff, I actually wanted me to take a look at this, but actually I took a look at this a long time ago um, and actually kind of in response probably to that question, we took a look at the actual language on the ballot. This has been kicking around for a little bit, uh, but you know, I think it's really important that especially people running for city council uh, support uh, city services. Uh, um, and this is an important and vital function that we need to get right and get right now. Great. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you on the website. All right, um, we'll be there. Commissioner Udaley, your thoughts about the levy and why you were a very early supporter. Yeah, well, I mean, I was one of the commissioners that referred it to the ballot. I endorsed it. I also submitted an argument in favor of it in the voters pamphlet, which will be coming out soon. Uh, this funding is critical, especially in light of the COVID crisis and the decreases to both the general fund and other uh, parks revenue streams that we know that we've seen and will continue until this crisis is over. We need these funds to maintain and improve our system. And parks and community centers, I think are kind of an undervalued but really critical part of our social infrastructure that will be so critical to our recovery and resiliency. So although it's hard to ask people to dig deeper in their pockets in this moment, um, it's just vitally important that we don't let our parks uh, system decline. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what role do you think parks should play and what role should uh, PPNR, Portland Parks and Recreation, play in addressing systemic racism? Commissioner, would you like to go first? Unmute myself again. Um, Parks are essential to all of our communities, uh, but I think they're particularly critical to BIPOC communities and other uh, underserved communities in our city. We are, as we face this challenging funding decisions with our budget, equity and racial justice must be centered. We've made strides in recent years toward greater equity, but we know that communities in East Portland and North Portland in particular are still underserved by our current park system. So we need to uh, understand how BIPOC communities experience and navigate public space differently. And by that, I mean, whether they feel safe to use our parks and if not, uh, what we can do through design to support uh, greater use, the importance of these spaces for gatherings, festivals and celebrations for many culturally specific communities. And we also need to continue to strive toward diversity, equity and inclusion within the Bureau. Thank you. Mingus? Um, yes, I actually think parks play a crucial role in helping to mitigate the impacts of uh, racism. Uh, one good example would be, um, you know, parks count is just infrastructure improvements. Uh, in my opening, I talked about how you can uh, look at an aerial map of a city and tell where rich people live and poor people live. Uh, a lot of that has to do with where parks are placed which implies that one of the ways we can undo the historic impact of uh, racial discrimination in our planning processes is to place parks in communities of color and low income communities. Also, I'll point out that in the context of Portland, our Parks Bureau is, uh, I think, our largest employer uh, uh, for summer jobs for youth. Uh, so that is an incredible and an important um, equity uh, equalizer. 
And again, uh, parks provide uh, crucial services to uh, members of the BIPOC community, especially the kids, things like the camps, the uh, lunch programs, the swim programs, many of which I've participated in and my kids participated in too. They really make a difference and I'll fight for that when I'm on city council. So one of the uh, conundrums of, of parks, particularly doing new ones or improvements to existing parks is gentrification that yeah. it often triggers. How would you uh, un unravel that knot? Make sure. sure. First. No, no, please, you. Me? Okay, uh, I apologize. Uh, this is a great question. And actually, uh, this theme pervades a lot of the planning decisions that uh, are that the city grapples with. We could talk about parks, but we could also talk about transportation or uh, zoning, for example. I think the lesson here is that the city needs to do something is it has failed to do, and that is to develop meaningful displacement programs. Uh, 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 infrastructure often means development and growth, and we push people out. Um, it's possible, and we should develop plans to prevent that from happening. I used to be executive director for Historic Park Rose, which is a nonprofit dedicated to promoting equitable economic development in the park. Park Rose neighborhood. And in that position, I demonstrated how we can stabilize uh, neighborhoods and grow businesses without displacing people. And when I'm on city council, I will push for programs and initiatives like that too. Commissioner? Uh, so my first uh, action as city commissioner was to pass uh, the relocation ordinance, which is one of the strongest renter protections Portland renters have had since World War II and serves as an anti-displacement measure, which stabilized tens of thousands of renters across the city and gave them a fair uh, chance of relocating in their communities of choice if they were uh, forced to move through no fault of their own. I've led the charge on anti-displacement work at the city. Um, my work has resulted in the uh, upcoming establishment of the anti-displacement task force. And I'm currently working on a tenant opportunity to purchase uh, program, which would give renters and affordable housing providers first right of refusal when units go up for sale and help low income Portlanders become homeowners. The Port, Port, city of Portland is guilty of aiding and abetting, abetting gentrification and displacement. We got here by design, and now we have to design our way out of it. It's one of, it's one of my top priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if the levy passes, uh, there's going to be $48 million a year um, that parks will have. Um, uh, as if you were a uh, parks commissioner, how would you prioritize that money? What would be your top three? Try to be uh, priorities. Try to be as specific as you can. Me? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, commissioner, you want to go first? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Can you uh, repeat the question? Yeah, and sure, what, sure. What number question is this? Uh, well, the ones I gave you would be um, number four. Okay, great. And the, repeat the question? Sure. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, uh, there's lots of priorities. If the levy passes, there would be $48 million. Uh, uh, I got it. Your top yeah. Priorities. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, number one is maintaining services for uh, underserved communities and vulnerable populations. Number two would be to protect and to continue to do uh, environmental restoration throughout our park system. And the third would be uh, maintaining safe and clean facilities for the public. If this measure doesn't pass, there is no doubt that we are going to have to make programmatic cuts, personnel cuts, and close facilities, it, it will be pretty devastating to our whole, whole community. Uh, but those are three of the priorities that I would uh, move forward with in the unfortunate circumstance of, a, of that levy not passing. Mingus? 
Um, I agree with the commissioner. If this levy doesn't pass, our parks, uh, our park system is going to be in crisis. That's why it's so important for everyone at home to um, vote for it if you can afford to. Um, my priorities for how we spend these dollars when they come in, uh, focus in on uh, restoring services, especially to underserved communities. Um, uh, the other thing which I think is really important is that we continue our work on environmental uh, um, conservation and restoration. And finally, I think we have to uh, protect jobs, both uh, the regular staff jobs we see at the city uh, or we see uh, at the Bureau, but also especially the uh, summer jobs program that largely serve um, BIPOC youth. Um, those are the things I'm going to fight for when this levy passes, and I look forward to being on council to help get those um, important programs up and going and stabilized. Let's do a, a quick 30 second um, follow up. Uh, uh, if it doesn't pass, what's the what's the first thing you would cut? Me? Uh, I think the, the important thing to say here is that there's no good answer. Uh, um, and I think we really ought to avoid this future. Um, you know, we have this bureau has suffered enormous cuts over the past several years. Uh, there's not a lot of fat left on the bone. Um, you know, I want to preserve I'm somewhere between two priorities. You know, I think we need to uh, preserve access to services. Uh, uh, I think we need to hold on to our equity lens. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, to the, at the same time, you know, if we had to prioritize things, you know, I think that uh, um, if we don't pass this, certainly we're gonna we're gonna continue to defer maintenance um, on our parks facilities. I think we are not gonna see. Uh, okay. That's great, um, Commissioner. What would you cut? You, you, you. I got to say, I think that's an unfair question for either of us, having never uh, run the Parks Bureau. And if I've learned anything from my experience with the budget the last four years, any conversation about cuts to the parks have to begin with a community-wide conversation. Portlanders do not cotton to uh, parks being first on the chopping block. And I'm going to uh, you know, after last year where we really cut the budget to the quick, um, I'll be fighting to keep parks off that chopping block next year. Thank you. Um, how would you address, there's about half a billion backlog uh, uh, of, of capital needs. Uh, and, you know, when uh, the polling was done for the levy, there was, you know, uh, soft support for a bond. Yep. Um, and uh, so do you support a bond and, or are there other ways to address this problem without raising people's taxes? Commissioner, you want to go first? Uh, we need to continue the conversation that Commissioner Fish began last year about truly sustainable future for our park system. There were pros and cons to all of the options presented to us as far as uh, volatility and compression and whether they were progressive or regressive uh, funding sources. The bonds rose to the top for me, but that was last year before this crisis, before this funding feeding frenzy we're seeing at the November ballot, where I'm very concerned even for the measures that I have endorsed uh, in this moment where we know a third, at least a third of Portlanders are suffering real financial impacts from COVID. Um, so yeah, I, I, I will leave it at that, thanks. Mingus? Um, I do support, um, I would support a bond to help uh, catch up on the backlog of capital uh, projects that we have. Um, but I think that we do owe it to Portlanders to first develop some sort of comprehensive plan to restore our park system to stability. Um, and then after that, I suspect a bond will probably be part of that plan. And I also wanna get us to at least long-term start to think about other ways to um, diversify our, our parks fundings, uh, especially things like uh, special taxing districts and whatnot. Um, so to that end, do you support uh, independent parks district? Uh, uh, there's a lot of park supporters who um, are really into that. Other cities have them, Seattle or closer to home, Tualatin. Um, yeah, actually I do. I think that this is something which makes a lot of sense for us. You know, 
that there is a, a paradox built into the way we are currently funding our parks. You know, we want to make them accessible. Uh, um, we're fee based, but we want to make them accessible. So our fees need to be low. Uh, um, and it just is never penciled out. I mean, how many times have we come together in arenas like this to talk about the funding crisis at, at parks? Another thing that we just know politically and culturally is Portlanders love their parks. It's just time for us to figure this out. Um, and I'm happy to do it. I think that park, uh, the, a bond, uh, a bond, a special taxing district and uh, public private partnerships are exciting ways to move us forward. Commissioner? Well, uh, I was enthusiastic about the idea of a parks district when I first learned about it. It sure seemed like it could be a cure-all for many of the challenges we're facing with the system. But again, uh, compression is a serious concern and, and would have real consequences beyond, beyond that district. So it wasn't a top contender in the conversation about sustainable funding. However, uh, I don't think the conversation has been exhausted. It's worth uh, revisiting. It also means the city of Portland wouldn't run our park system any longer. So that's a conversation to have as well. Um, I haven't entirely ruled it out, but my my gut is that that it may not uh, deliver everything that, that we're hoping for. And for those who uh, don't know the term compression, um, that's basically under the uh, tax limitations of the 90s that were put into place. When you add a, a, a tax, a partic particularly a property tax of some kind, it, uh, compresses other um, um, taxes that are already in place. So for instance, uh, uh, the children's levy or the library levy or, or um, uh, o OH, uh, Oregon Historical Society. So uh, it can have a lo lot of impacts beyond you know, just improving parks. Um, let's see here, let's, uh, let's kick over to a sort of speed round of just some quick questions. Um, first up, Favorite park east of 82nd, Mingus? Oh, um, Cully. I think they just added a nice park over there and I thought that was a great new addition. And I'd also say I'm really uh, fond of, and actually this is a better answer because we actually, we my, my kids and I use it. Um, and a lot of people might not know it, uh, Gateway Green, um, which is, I don't, yeah, Gateway Green, which is a lovely bike park. Um, I think it's a wonderful addition to the um, to the Park Rose neighborhood, and um, and um, and it, okay. that's great. Yeah, we can keep these these quick, Commissioner. Mine is also Gateway Green. It's a fantastic new park, and it's one of several examples of the way that Portland has been striving to really close the gap on inequitable investments in East Portland in the last few years, and especially under the leadership of Commissioner Fritz and Commissioner Fish. Um, a to F, how would you grade, grade uh, Ted Wheeler's mayorship? Commissioner? I um, absolutely decline to grade my colleagues. I, I just, I don't feel that that is a fair or relevant com question to this conversation and it's just not one that I'm willing to answer. I, I will say that, that Mayor Wheeler has been more supportive of my very progressive work around uh, housing and the environment and transportation uh, than I ever imagined that he would. We're very different kinds of people with uh, very different backgrounds and very different, I think, political leanings. So he has actually been uh, a good partner on, on city council. Thanks. Mingus? Yeah, I think I'll kick the can down the road on actually putting a grade um, on, um, on the mayor. I will uh, say that um, I respect um, his service to the city, Commissioner Udaley's service to the city. One thing you'll learn once you uh, throw your hat into the ring is that this is very challenging work. Um, and I know everyone comes to it with um, really good intentions and an open heart. And I thank anyone who has the courage to step forward, including the mayor and Sarah. <laughs> Up or down, off-road cycling in Forest Park, for it or get it? Mingus? Um, 
I'm probably for it. Um, yeah, uh, um, but I would hear that discussion. It's another big conversation we have to have. I'm not completely opposed to it. I think it could be done uh, in a responsible way, but I can't make a blanket up or down statement on it today. Okay. Um, and last, all time favorite city commissioner or mayor? Commissioner? Well, I'm going to have to go with my childhood friend, Eric Sten. Uh, you know, it was the housing justice movement that led me to run for city council. But if Eric and I hadn't known each other as kids, I don't think I ever would have ran. Number one, because seeing Eric run and win that seat made me realize that uh, people like us could serve uh, in elected office. But also, uh, I brought an author to meet him, Billy Wimsat, in 2000. And I met uh, one of his staffers, Marshall Runkle. And it was Marshall who encouraged and convinced me to run, ran my first campaign, and now serves as my chief of staff. So while there are many uh, notable former commissioners and mayors that I hate to leave out, I, I think Eric's actually had the biggest impact on my life. So I'll go with him. Great. Mingus? Um, I'm glad you asked this. Uh, Charles Jordan, uh, who was served both on city council and um, was also a parks commissioner. You know, I um, when I graduated from college way back in the day, like the 1990s, uh, I started doing local government work right away. And so I'd be in city hall um, sometimes and I'd see, and this Portland was a different place back then. I was one of the few African-Americans um, in, in the building, uh, but I did notice this other guy, Charles Jordan, and I had a couple of reasons to be in meetings with him or interact with him a little bit. And I was young and dumb and actually didn't know at some point in our interactions, I realized, oh, wow, not only is he the parks guy, he used to be a city councilor. Um, and that was a real flash for me. I remember thinking, oh, wow, you look like me. And if you go and take a look at, at Charles, he really looks like me. And one of the lessons I got from that flash is like, oh, I could do this work too, just like um, Jordan. And it really did impact my life and got me to um, this Zoom meeting right now. Right. Um, I'm going to do a question from the chat um, box. Um, how will you mobilize the energy of neighborhood associations and friends and allies groups to um, uh, play a, a larger role in, in parks uh, uh, maintenance and programming? You want to start, Mingus? Oh, sure. Um, I think this is a great idea. You know, I used to be the program coordinator for the city's neighborhood association system. So I know those folks well. And one of the things uh, uh, that is true about neighborhood associations is that they love their parks. They're eager to um, engage and try to, um, uh, you know, keep those places clean and safe. And, and indeed at a time when, um, when maintenance dollars are gonna be low, a great thing that we could actually do is enlist you know, neighborhood associations and other uh, local community groups to help with just basic cleanups and keeping us aware of problems in the park. Um, I know they're eager to do that and I can imagine ways in which we could pull the, uh, the, co the neighborhood coalition offices to dim uh, disseminate information about how we can get this done. And I guarantee you there are thousands of volunteers out there in the neighborhood association system who are eager to do exactly this work. And I think we should let them. And when I'm there, I will facilitate that connection. Commissioner? Sure. Well, Portland is often among the top cities for volunteerism. So we already have an incredible uh, community that is ready and willing to give given the opportunity. I think it's creating those opportunities and, and engaging more people that's gonna be critical. We have seen participation in our neighborhood associations decline over the decades. And I would love to see more people getting involved with uh, neighborhood efforts, whether it's through their neighborhood associations or through uh, other organizations organized around identity or political causes, uh, what have you. I am working on setting up an online civic engagement platform. It should be up in October and it'll be a great tool for uh, organizing and deploying all our thousands of amazing community members who wanna support uh, our parks and beyond. Um, do you, uh, 
I have to say, it's e easy to say that. Um, um, our organization, the Portland Parks Foundation, used to do an event um, called Park A Diem that turned out hundreds of volunteers for a day of service. And it, it, it overwhelmed uh, Portland Parks and Recreation. And uh, you know, a common issue is, is the, uh, uh, of, of staff capacity to deal with volunteer groups. Um, how would you contend with that issue? Particularly if the levy doesn't pass, because it's a, everybody kind of defaults to, to um, yeah, volunteers, yay. Um, but yeah. uh, you know, how 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 do you deal with it when uh, you know it, it takes capacity at the receiving end? Well, thanks for the nightmare scenario, Randy. <laughs> as if we need another crisis to deal with. And I do want to say we can't replace jobs with volunteers. Uh, but there is a lot of critical work that is appropriate for volunteers. I agree with you and I share your frustration both uh, before I joined city council and now that I'm here. My earliest engagement with the city of Portland was trying to push them on accessibility and inclusion in their parks and playgrounds. My son has a disability, he uses a wheelchair. Uh, the majority of our parks facilities aren't accessible to him in a really meaningful way or I should say playgrounds. Uh, and I was offering parks $50,000 to raise $50,000 to install swings across the city, but the capacity wasn't there um, to install and maintain them. And so they actually wanted me, a low income single mom, to keep fundraising, to continue to repair and maintain and replace these swings, which wasn't something I could take on. Uh, so I, I'm out of time, wasn't able to answer the question directly, just acknowledge the frustration that we have to do better. And I think that um, using tools like this online platform can help. Mingus? Um, so can you repeat the question? Um, that, uh, the sort of, uh, the idea of um, turning out volunteers to work in parks um, and, and to improve parks is, is a sort of easy default question everybody wants to do that everybody wants to work in their parks but part, part of the problem is there's a there's been a bottleneck at uh, at portland parks and recreation in terms of just sheer capacity to deal with that and to, and to deal with the as as commissioner Udaly pointed out things like maintenance of stuff that they want to put into parks sure well i mean I agree i don't know if we can uh, count on volunteers to do maintenance like replacing uh, broken swings but we can certainly count on volunteers to help with cleanups that's why i'm so excited about the concept of uh, enlisting neighborhood associations to help with cleanups uh, literally that's one of the classic neighborhood activities that neighborhood associations do they know how to get it done and they are uh, clustered into uh, neighborhood coalition offices we could work with the neighborhood coalition offices to you know to to develop, you know, weekends of action where uh, specific neighborhoods go in and help clean up their parks. Actually, having done much of my career has been organized around uh, organizing events exactly like that. Um, doing it through the neighborhood system is perfect. It won't be a heavy lift. I think we can get this done. I'm not even sure how much funding we need to have for this. Frankly, if, there, if, the, if the Bureau of Civic Life is uh, healthy, we should have the staff capacity to do that right now. Thank you. So a significant portion of the lands managed by Portland Parks and Recreation are natural areas that are set aside to provide public access to nature and to protect water quality and wildlife and habitat. Um, do you think these lands need to be uh, uh, utilized? Can they be used, utilized differently? Or do you feel like they're sort of preserves off limits? Me? Mm -hmm. um I would say I I think they should be preserved. Uh, I, I think embedded in that question, uh, there's a false choice which I reject. You know, I think we can do. I think we can preserve our open spaces and protect water, while at the same time accommodating um, you know growth. Um, and certainly one of the things I don't want to sacrifice is the green space that we do have left, because one of the changes we're going to see in our city over time is increased density, which is why you know parks are so important. They get you know people who are living in tight, tight quarters like all of us are now, um, an opportunity to get outside. Um, so no, I do not support um, sacrificing our open spaces to accommodate you know, new development, for example. Commissioner? Well, 
as much as I'm not a huge fan of golf, I am a huge fan of green and open spaces and any conversation about putting these spaces to a different uh, use would have to be carefully considered and weighed against any kind of ecological impact. So uh, there may be select areas that could be used differently than they are now, but I would oppose anything that would take away significant green space uh, or uh, do further harm to our the delicate ecological areas that a lot of these places intersect with. So these same areas are, um, you know, facing a lot of challenges with uh, camping. Um, and in fact, during the fires, you know, even became, um, you know, potentially, you know, danger zones for, um, you know, fires to get uh, started. Um, you know, our problem with uh, folks not having, um, you know, having to live outdoors is that it's, it's probably going to grow and, and possibly exponentially. Um, how would you approach this challenging issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis parks? Commissioner, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> Again, with the disasters, Randy. Um, I thought talking about parks was going to be more fun. Uh, yeah. So one of the one of the early efforts I made at City Hall was really looking at um, camping, urban camping, uh, people living outdoors, and how we were treating them at the city level, making sure that our policies were as humane as possible. We made a lot of gains, but where we fell short was that we didn't guarantee that if we move someone, they'll have some, we have somewhere to move them to. And I think that's the critical piece of this conversation. Uh, some people might see our natural areas as empty, but uh, they are not empty. They are full of life and they're quite fragile. And uh, the, the intersection between our most vulnerable community members living on the street and our fragile ecosystem is something that I'm very concerned with. It's, we had to deal with it in Forest Park during the fire threat. Uh, and I'm very committed to getting people out of, par out of the parks and off the streets and into safe sanctioned uh, shelter. Mingus? Um, I have very much the same view. You know, we are the, in the middle of a public health crisis. Um, the CDC has given us directions about um, best practices for navigating this moment. Certainly having uh, Portlanders uh, live in our parks is um, not, uh, does not constitute good social distancing. Um, as we head into the bad weather, I'm very much concerned about the uh, potential for spread of COVID amongst our houseless population. Indeed, if you take a look at our COVID numbers right now, you see that they are beginning to climb again. We've given back most of the progress that we made over the summer. Um, that's why um, I feel like it's imperative that the city develop a plan and implement it, frankly, before the election. But how we can move people um, who are sleeping on our streets and in our parks um, inside, or at least to a um, an organized space that provides them with uh, adequate social distancing, uh, um, adequate hygiene um, equipment, um, and access to social services. Um, if we don't do that, I think we are we set ourselves up for the kind of uh, human disaster which is currently reflected in the sort of immense disaster we see in our parks bureaus. Uh, um, uh, we need to do better, and sort of uh, deferring the problem will only make it worse. Um. I want to follow with both of you on this. Uh, uh, do you see a specific measure that we could either enlarge or something new that we could create to, to deal with this problem? Is there a different approach that you uh, can see? Because uh, I mean, it, you know, th those are all great generalities. I think everybody you know, agrees with them. Um, but uh, uh, what, what's a specific step that, uh, that you would take uh, if you were parks commissioner to, to really uh, tackle this problem in a, in a newer or, or enlarged way? Sure. Well, I think we have to, uh, me or? Yeah, no, no, please make it. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, I think one of the things we really do have to do um, as a council is to come together 
and um, identify a set of spaces um, where we have organized camps where people can um, rest and sleep and clean themselves. I think on the inner east side, if you've uh, um, seen the camps that are set up in the central east side industrial area, I think those are those are great models. Uh, um, I've talked to, I've met with the businesses down there um, and with some of the people who live in those camps and um, everyone has some criticisms, but at the same time, everyone agrees that it, it's working, you know, it's better than nothing. Um, and I'll tell you, when you get down to, you know, some car parks blocks, for example, which are unsafe, unhygienic, uh, um, and are really going to be, um, or have the potential to be a, a public so source of, you know, disease spread um, as the weather gets bad, you know, we need to do something. I think we have public spaces, including, frankly, underutilized park spaces, uh, um, where I think that we could set up organized camps. And um, I think we have to do that. Not doing that is just, um, I think, negligent from a public policy and a public health point of view. Thank you. Commissioner? Yep, you're here. So new ideas. Yeah, new ideas um, or something you would double down on. Sure. Well, even before the COVID uh, crisis, uh, I was looking closely at every PBOT property to uh, determine whether or not any of them would be suitable for sanctioned camps. And specifically in the Central East Side, where we're working very closely with the Central East Side Industrial Council. And we found a couple sites and COVID hit, different sites were selected. I still think that we need to have not just a citywide, but a conversation with the county, the school districts, really any public entity that holds assets and properties in the city about how we're utilizing them, especially those that are sitting empty. We have schools and community centers and other facilities that have bathrooms and showers and kitchens and, and laundry facilities. And we're six months in, we still don't see bottom. We have to assess our resources and pivot quickly to putting them to use, helping people get off the street. Thank you. Thanks. So um, to switch to, let's say a more fun topic, more creative topic, um, describe a public private partnership that you would initiate if you were parks commissioner. Want to start commissioner? Oh gosh, this is probably the question I've given the least amount of thought to. Um, I know the public partner, public private partnerships are kind of like the a hot topic right now. I approach them with an open mind and some skepticism. I always want to ensure that the city is getting as much or more than they're giving in those partnerships. And I think that the bike share program is an excellent example where Nike actually fully funds that program. We don't pay anything for those bikes. We have some uh, staff time that goes to administrating it. Um, this is maybe a little bit of a stretch, but there's another question here about the management of our street trees. I think the way that we are handling it now, leaving up the planting and maintenance uh, to adjacent property owners is a terrible way to manage such an essential asset. And I have been looking at possible funding through utilities, power companies, phone companies, uh, to work with the city to come up with a funding stream for the city to take that take that over. But I'm not going to let them brand our trees. Mingus? Uh, yeah, I'm actually kind of excited about uh, this question and this space at this moment. You know, uh, one of the things that I think parks could do is to help um, our businesses and neighbors, neighborhoods recover for, or adjust to this post-COVID moment. You know, just as we have expanded uh, restaurant uh, dining onto the sidewalks, I could see us expanding more services uh, um, into our parks areas. So I could imagine and, and excited about doing things like maybe moving food pods or outdoor dining or, um, you know, socially distanced music venues or opportunities to parks and then charging a small fee for that. Um, I think that would both get our businesses open while uh, uh, um, being safe and actually uh, create opportunities for, um, you know, public private partnerships and really activating our parks. I think that's one of the low hanging fruits that we have missed as, as 
Portlanders. And I think especially folks who have traveled uh, internationally, I'm told many other cities, especially in Europe, do a much better job of integrating services like you know dining and whatnot into their public spaces. I think we should look at that. Thank you. Commissioner Udaly, you came into your job as a complete rookie. Um, what was your biggest rookie error in your uh, time so far? There, there's a couple that come to mind. Um, I would say I have very few regrets about um, policies that we've pursued or votes that I've taken. Uh, what remains my biggest regret is the 2018 budget vote where we increased the police bureau uh, staffing authority by 50 positions. They had asked for 100. I spent months and I and my office spent months negotiating that number down absent of any rationale for staffing for the police bureau. And I guess at the time 50 felt like a victory and there's also a lot of pressure to vote yes on the budget. And so at that point, only 18 months into my term, I didn't have the wherewithal to really stand my ground on that issue. And, and that's something that I, that I would definitely like to do over. Thanks. What would you consider to be your greatest success in your time on council? It really has to be my work around uh, tenant protections. As I mentioned before, the reload ordinance and also fair uh, access and renting are the strongest renter protections Portland renters have had since World War II when we were in a, when it, we were in a different kind of housing crisis. They paved the path for the state to pass stronger statewide protections, and they've also uh, been considered and even adopted by cities around the country. FAIR, in fact, is now being considered to be a national model for uh, reducing housing discrimination. So uh, I'm very proud of that work, first and foremost, because we have helped stabilize tens of thousands of uh, vulnerable renters and, our, and we have decreased barriers to housing. And we are now in our 11th year of a housing crisis. So I consider that to be my greatest accomplishment and some of the most important work I have to do going forward. Thank you. Mingus, um, of your career, um, what would be uh, an accomplishment that you think most um, crystallizes your qualifications to be a city commissioner? Oh gosh, I have had an awfully diverse career, you know. Um, um, I am both, I have a PhD in political science and I've split my career between being uh, an academic where I teach on issues of urban politics and I've also been a public servant here in Portland. You know, uh, my academic research uh, focuses in on issues of, around race and inequality and public policy. Um, and uh, the way my career works is I kind of go into the academic world and explore ideas and then I go back into the public world and try to apply these ideas. So I've also served as the uh, program coordinator for the city's neighborhood association system. I've been a supervisor for the city's crime prevention program. I've worked in uh, Multnomah County uh, Chair's office. Um, I've worked for Portland Public Schools in their intergovernmental relations office. Um, and for me, with a, it, it's all of a piece. It's wonderful to take ideas, apply them to the real world, and then have the real world really kind of inform your ideas uh, um, and make you smarter. And you know, my whole career is about kind of repeating that loop and along the way, I think one of the things that we've been able to do is to make the lives of Portlanders better. I'm extremely proud of the work that we did uh, to make uh, the Park Rose in East Portland a safer, more livable place. I'm proud of the work we did in every corner of the city to make this neighborhood association system uh, uh, um, strong and healthy and more inclusive. And I'm proud of the work I did at the Crime Prevention Program to help keep Portlanders uh, um, safe and secure in their neighborhoods and their parks. Uh, let's drill down on one of those, though. Um, um, let's talk about maybe a situation in which you had to um, really bring together a diverse group of partners, something that would be akin to um, counting to three uh, on city council, um, where you, you know, maybe didn't get uh, uh, everybody, but uh, sure. uh, to make a tough compromise. Name, uh, drill down on one for me. Well, I'll tell you, I, on a personal level, this is the experience that... Um, 
I think shaped me most of my uh, recent public work. Back when I was executive director for Historic Park Rose, um, we had a little storefront office at 111th and Sandy. Um, and frankly, we one of people talk a lot about my relationship to the police department. And the or the the origins of that is when I was the executive director for that um, organization, Historic Park Rose. It's it's one of the old police contact stations back in the day when we used to do police, uh, community policing. Community policing has gone long, gone away, uh, but there's still this tradition of cops kind of coming by to have a cup of coffee or to fill out paperwork or have community meetings. Um, and we kind of shared the office and the maintenance of the office. We had a, um, a cleaning lady who worked in the office. And uh, one day she broke her foot and um, couldn't, um, uh, couldn't come to work anymore. And because she couldn't come to work anymore, she couldn't, um, uh, she couldn't pay her rent. And so uh, she got evicted. And one day she came into the office and said, Mengus, um, I've, I'm going to lose my rent. I'm going to lose my house. I got these. She literally had three grandchildren uh, um, living with her. Um, it was one of these bad winters when there was snow on the ground. Um, she's like, Mingus, what do I do? Um, and it's a tough situation because I worked houselessness hard and I know those issues in Park Rose and you know the options, you know, so of course we call around trying to figure out what the options are. Uh, no good options, you know, it's kind of down to does she and her family kind of go up to, to kind of wind it up here. Um, so the important thing is we pulled together uh, um, a coalition of neighborhood people uh, to find Pam housing and to keep her house. So we took up collections to keep her in a hotel. And then literally one of the things that we discovered is that in order to you know, find a low income person housing, what you need to do is get together a team of people and call every uh, apartment in Portland that they can possibly afford. And so you find one that works and we drove her out there to many, many different appointments. Eventually we got her uh, um, in one. One of the things that showed me is both uh, the challenge challenges that face uh, working class Portlanders. I was shocked and disappointed at the city services that uh, were available for families like Pam. And that's one of the things that actually got me to step closer to city halls. I realized real people were in pain and I saw how the system failed people even in the dead of winter. So you guys have done a lot of these. Uh, uh, this is the third one in 24 hours, uh, I think Mingus uh, said. Um, um, what have you come to admire about the other? Commissioner, you want to go first? Uh, I think that Mr. Maps um, has a real passion for his work and for his community. Uh, and while we don't agree on many issues and we have a very different kind of um, backers and supporters, I have to respect that. Mingus? Oh, um, this is kind of easy. I actually like uh, Commissioner Udaley a lot. I always have. Um, I very much view her as um, an inspiration and role model to me. One of the reasons why I'm in this race is I saw uh, Commissioner Udaley as a young single parent uh, um, being in City Hall, navigating that. You know, one of the reasons why I never thought I could do that is, you know, I'm a single dad of a 10 year old and an 11 year old, and I couldn't imagine how I could deal with. Uh, more stuff on my plate. I saw the uh, Commissioner U Daily uh, do it. I knew it was tough, uh, um, and I admire her toughness. Um, also, I'd say over the course of the campaign, um, 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 I've seen Commissioner U Daily. It's it's been, we've been engaged in a dialogue that's gone across you know many different meetings, and I've actually enjoyed that dialogue a lot. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, you know, I'm not here to. Um, I'm a different leader, but I'm not here to destroy uh, Commissioner Udaley's legacy. I'm here to build on it. And I think we're at a different moment in history um, and a different you know, voice would be helpful. But this is not really a negation of anything that uh, Commissioner Udaley has accomplished. She's accomplished a lot and I'm proud of her. Well, Mingus, I appreciate you calling me young, but we're actually the same age. I turned 50 this year. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so if you had to, bring it down to a single uh, issue that really uh, uh, divides you, what would that be? Um, Commissioner, you want to go first? I have to admit that it's getting harder and harder to, term to determine what that single issue is because Mr. Maps has been tacking to the left um, quite a bit in recent weeks and trying to close that gap, I think, between his policy positions and mine. Uh, 
I've read his platform and there just isn't enough substance for me to determine where he really stands on a lot of issues. So I will just say um, I've pledged not to take money from the police union. He's backed by the police union. I have fought for render protections. He's backed by the landlord lobby. And I have uh, fought for things like the Portland Clean Energy Fund and uh, other uh, important issues to Portlander that the PBA, that Portland Business Alliance has opposed and he's backed by PBA. So, uh, you know, I just have to assume that we, there are substantive differences between us and uh, I have the track record to prove it. Thank you. Mingus? Uh, sure, um, there's a couple of barbs there. Uh, maybe I'll try to start by answering the question, which is, um, you know, I think you, Daly, and I share many of the same uh, core values. I think we approach and view the jobs as being fundamentally uh, in fundamentally different ways. You know, uh, and I think the difference here is that in a Portland city government, um, being that chief operating officer in charge of a large bureau is a really important um, job, and it's a huge part of the job. Um, I have spent a lot of my professional life um, trying to help you know government bureaucracies work. Uh, um, and I'm good at it. Frankly, I think that the chaos and the scandals that we see in many of the bureaus that Commissioner Udaley have touched are a product of her leadership style, which is, um, you know, not about building bridges and it's not about um, evaluating evidence. You know, indeed, she's famous for uh, burning bridges and being fundamentally driven by ideology as opposed to, um, you know, best practices. Well, okay. Um, it feels like there needs to be a rebuttal there, um, and you, sure. uh, there's a lot, to re lot, lot to take on there, but let's try to do a quick rebuttal. Sure. Um, first of all, I've heard the ideologically driven comment one too many times, and I have to say that not only is it unfounded, but it really smacks of red baiting to me. I am significantly more progressive than Mingus. I'm not driven by a set ideology, but I do have values and principles uh, that are very strong and guide my policy making. Uh, as far as the chaos and scandals and controversies at my bureaus, that's nonsense. I have overseen the Bureau of Development Services, uh, Portland Bureau of Transportation, and the Office of Community and Civic Life. I've brought transformational change to all of those bureaus, both internally and as far as our service to the public. What he's referring to are some complaints, internal complaints uh, from employees of civic life who are unhappy. Those complaints have not been substantiated. There is no, he's fond of saying abuse, fraud and waste, which has nothing to do uh, with this situation. And you know, I pause when you ask me what I admire about Mr. Maps because the reality is I'm running against someone who is spreading misinformation about my work, about my bureaus and inflating his own accomplishments. And I think that if you were listening to his response to how have you counted to three uh, is pretty clear, he hasn't. Uh, and so, you know, I really don't wanna end this on a negative note but I've been enduring uh, these criticisms and insults for months now. And once again, let's have this fight based on the facts and based on the merits of our work. Thank you. Um, I would like to not end on a negative note either, um, um, but I do wanna ask a follow-up to Mingus because uh, that was kind of a broadside. And so I guess I would be interested in, in you know, there's the, the uh, Office of Neighborhood uh, um, issue that has been well reported. Uh, what would you describe, for instance, as a, as a burnt bridge or a major uh, scandal within PBA? Uh, within PBA, actually, I think I, you hear very little criticisms from me from PBOT about PBOT. I think actually I admire the work that's being done over there. I think that's a very professional organization. I think the difference between- Or another bureau. Um, I mean, another bureau that's been managed. Oh, uh, uh, Civic Life. I mean, this is a well-known, well-documented fact. Other than Civic Life. 
Well, right now, currently, the U Daily is the commissioner in charge of civic life and Peabot. Um, I admire the work being done by um, um, Peabot. Partly, I think the difference there is that that's a very uh, um, highly trained, um, large organization that has kind of robust safety systems, just not true over at, at Civic Life. Um, that's a bureau that is uh, adrift. Um, the ombudsman has uh, criticized them for uh, abusive behavior and was deeply disturbed by an investigation into dis abusive behavior that she felt got um, sidetracked inappropriately by City Hall. That's very concerning. Um, and I'm not, and I, I don't, Play games. It is very concerning. I think every Portlander who Google's, you know, civic life obstacleman uh, for the last two weeks will find a report that will um, blow your socks off. Okay, let's turn to part, fi final uh, uh, statements. Uh, uh, I have to call it there. Uh, okay. let's, uh, let's turn to the horizon. Imagine that you were assigned the Parks uh, Bureau. Um, what would be what would it look like in four years? How would it substantially be different in in uh, in four years? Mingus, do you want to go ahead and start on that? Uh, sure. Well, first, you know, I think we need to recognize that this COVID crisis is going to take several years to actually work through. So I want to get the city through the COVID crisis while maintaining um, um, an equity focus for our parks and um, recreational services uh, to our people who take advantage of parks. We have to maintain our commitment to, um, to our green spaces, especially the ones that are owned on parks. I'd like to see us begin to make progress um, on the backlog of maintenance issue over at parks. Um, I think we need to um, do everything we can to remove the barriers that prevent uh, people of color and low income folks from uh, fully taking advantage of parks. And uh, in four years, I think that we need to have developed a plan to provide our park system system with stable, sustainable funding. Thank you. Commissioner? Can you repeat that question? I got a little, uh, little uh, side. If back. you were to assign the Parks Bureau, um, how would it look different in four years? That is a big question. Uh, I mean, parks intersects with some of my top priorities, whether it's environment, racial justice, or equity. Uh, so that would, those would be uh, my focus moving forward. I've talked a lot about how the city of Portland is guilty of uh, social engineering through racist public policy. And even though we may be steering the ship in a different direction now, there's a lot of harm that's been done that needs to be uh, repaired. Uh, one of the examples I think of is the fact that the heat island disparity, disparity in the city almost very neatly runs along the lines of redlining in our, in our city. Uh, and so that historic, historic racist policies have led to uh, you know, inequities isn't a strong enough word. Like this has a real impact on real people's lives uh, as far as health and safety and just being able to, you know, enjoy public spaces. So um, there's a million things I'd like to do with parks, but I do think that those would have to be three top priorities. Great. I want to thank you both so much for taking an hour out of your busy schedules to be with us uh, today. Um, appreciate our audience, uh, especially those of you who uh, uh, elected to uh, contribute uh, to this. It was uh, free, but you could also uh, contribute. Um, it really helps the foundation put on these events. Um, we have future Green Dreams events um, planned, uh, and we also have a house party we're going to be doing on um, October 7th. Uh, where we're going to have uh, Commissioner-elect um, Carmen Rubio as our guest. Uh, so uh, look for that in your emails and um, everybody have a great uh, fall evening. And thanks again to Commissioner Udaly and Migas Maps. Thank you. Thank you.